This video is going to be going over the entire measurement and geometry unit. So this is going to be a little bit of a different unit. Um, you're going to be expected to read through and complete the notes on your own um, and then go through the practice questions. So in this video, I'm going to go over, I'm going to read through the note with you, highlight some key, key, um, key pieces of information, maybe some important steps, um, and then work through one or two practice questions and then leave the rest for you. Um, so feel free to jump ahead to the different lessons and the time codes um, in, the, in the about section for this video so you don't have to kind of uh, go through um, and listen to each one over and over again if you want to just kind of pick up and go to a different spot. So for our measurement geometry unit, we are going to be looking at six lessons. We're going to be looking at unit conversions, sum of squares, also known as or previously known as the Pythagorean theorem, area and perimeter of composite shapes, volume and surface area, angle geometry, and circle geometry. And so some of this might be familiar, some of it um, might be relatively easy for you, um, and ho but hopefully there are some things that are new or some things that um, you might have needed refreshing on just to make this a little bit more useful. So unit conversions. So even though metric is the official measurement system in Canada, the imperial system was used prior to the metric system and is still used in the United States and two other countries as well. I, be, I believe uh, Myanmar is one other one, and I believe there is one country in, um, in Africa that uses the metric system as well. And then everything else is metric, or sorry, imperial system. So the United States, Myanmar, and one other country use the imperial system. Everything else uses metric. But because we're so close to the United States, consequently, we still use imperial system measurements in everyday life. So for example, right, in lumber dimensions, construction, tools, cooking measurements, electronic screen sizes, right, a lot of things still use metric um, measurements. And we're, we're aware of them because we're so close to the United States. So to convert between metric and imperial, we can set up a, a proportion, basically two fractions, using a conversion factor, and then use cross multiplication to solve the proportion. So kind of like we're solving an equation. The conversion factors that we talk about would be these kind of things here. These are kind of unit rates. They tell us how much of one unit per one of another unit. So for example, over here, one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters. That's a unit rate. It's telling us how many centimeters in one inch. So in our proportion statement, we use the relationships above to create fractions. So we use that unit rate or that conversion factor as one of the fractions. So for example, if we want to convert 67 inches to centimeters, we have our one fraction over here. This is what we're given. 67 inches over an unknown number of centimeters. We then have our conversion factor over here. One inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters. The reason we set it up a fraction like this is to basically say 67 inches to an unknown number of centimeters is going to be proportional. It's going to be the same kind of change as one inch to 2.54 centimeters. We're keeping the same units, inches and centimeters. We're basically just trying to, trying to create an equivalent fraction with the unit rate or the conversion factor being our simplest term. So basically just trying to see, okay, how much bigger is it going to be? Now, one thing to note over on the side Right, the fractions need to be arranged that the numerators and the denominators have the same units. So if I look at my fractions, I have the inches on top here, and I have centimeters on the bottom here. Right, so they're lined up or they're ordered in the same way. You don't want to have them switched around because then it wouldn't be the same type of proportion. So the first step we do then is we cross multiply. Right, we cross multiply, we multiply the 67 with the 251, or sorry, 2.54, and the x with the 1. We end up with 170.18 equals 1x. In this case, we're just going to divide by the 1. We're just going to do that out of habit. Um, the chances are, in some cases, you will only have to divide by 1, which isn't really going to change anything as we see here. So in the end, we get that 67 inches is equal to 170.18 centimeters. So that is our conversion. So that's our final answer. 
go through another example, converting 600 milliliters to cups. So here we set it up a little bit different. We put our unit rate or our unit, um, our conversion factor on the left side. It doesn't really matter which side we put it on. I mean, it'll give us the same answer in the end. Things just might be a little bit backwards. So our conversion factor is on our left. What we are given is on our right and we cross multiply. So the 240 times X, one times 600. So we got 240 X equals 600. In this case, we need to divide. Now we need to divide by 240. So we're not dividing by one in this case, just of how, what unit we're looking for, how it's set up. So we're gonna divide by 240 and we get 2.5. So 600 milliliters is equal to 2.5 cups, right? So it's always following those same steps. Cross multiply, divide by whatever number is in front of the X, and then our final answer is our converted units. Example three, again, same idea. Same kind of setup. We have the same units in the same spot. This time we have what we're given on the, on the left what our unit factor on the right now again this we might say well why is the x on top this time and the the other given one on the bottom and again in this case it doesn't really matter as long as it's consistent across both sides so again once we set up our proportion we cross multiply we get 1x or 120 is equal to 1x divide by 1 doesn't change anything so that's okay 120 is equal to our is our kilometers per hour. So 75 miles per hour equals 120 kilometers per hour. Now in this case, the example four, one thing that we might need to do, we might have to convert to an in-between unit. We might not be able to just jump from the one unit to the other of what we're looking at. So for example, if we want to convert 1.08 meters to inches, we might not have the conversion factor for that. We might not have how many inches are in a meter or how many meters are in an inch. Right? So we might have to convert to an in-between unit. In this case, we're going to convert from meters to centimeters first. So we're going to convert from meters to centimeters, and then we're going to go from centimeters to inches because we do have the conversion factor for centimeters to inches. So again, we're setting up our proportion similar to the other ones that we've done. The same units are on the top as they are on the bottom. We're cross multiplying. In this case, we get 108 is equal to 1x. Divide by one, we get that one meter or 1.08 meters is equal to 108 centimeters. You might've been able to do that calculation in your head anyways without going through and doing the cross multiplication, which is okay. But doing the cross multiplication kind of ensures that we don't um, kind of mess anything up or we don't kind of uh, mix things up and get the wrong units or wrong conversion. So we take that answer, plug it into a new proportion, centimeters on top in this case, inches on the bottom, and we cross multiply. So 108 centimeters times one is equal to 2.54x. So we get 108 divided by 2.54, we get 42.52 equals x. So that means 108 or 100.08 meters is equal to 42.52 inches. You could also say 108 centimeters is equal to 42.52 inches. It's the same thing. Again, we're just at the final stage of what our question's asking. So I kind of reverted back to initially what we were looking for. So that's it for the lesson. The next part is to um, go through and try some of these conversions on your own. Right, so I'll go through two of them with you just to kind of get used to the idea. Right, and then I'll leave the rest for you to try on your own. So 27 inches to centimeters. So I have 27 inches over an unknown number of centimeters. And my conversion factor is one inch is equal to 2.54 centimeters. 
So I've taken what I've given on the left side and my conversion factor on the right. I have the inches lined up with the centimeters, or the inches lined up with the inches and centimeters with the centimeters to keep things equal on both sides, or the same setup. Now I'm going to cross multiply. So I end up with 1x is equal to 27 times 2.54. Sixty-eight point five eight. Next, I have to divide by one, or in the end, sixty-eight point five eight. This will be my converted unit or centimeters. I'll go through and do three. Two is the same thing, just kind of reversed from what we just did, but three is a different set. So from feet to meters, I'm going to start off with what I have. I have twenty-eight feet over an unknown number of meters. And my conversion factor is going to be, let me just go back up and scroll up. So my length, so one meter is 3.3 feet. So 3.3 feet is on top, one meter is on the bottom. Again, you will be given the conversion factors um, for anything that you have to do. Right? If not, you can always Google, look it up, see, um, just basically go like meter feet to meters, and you should be able to get or figure out the conversion factor. But in that case, you could probably also do the conversion itself. So it's set up properly. So I have feet on top, meters on the bottom. So it's organized correctly. I'm going to cross multiply. I get 28 is equal to 3.3x. Now I have to divide. So 28 divided by 3.3 is going to equal x. And I end up with x equals 8.48 repeating, or you could say 8.5. So that means that 28 feet is equal to 8.48 meters. Or if we want to round it, we can say 8.5 meters. So again, the goal for you is to work through these practice questions. You have two examples right now, so it's going to be the same idea, um, just using different conversion factors. The next lesson is on sum of squares. Now, sum of squares is a, con is a formula slash concept that involves the three sides of a right angle triangle. Now, it was formerly known as Pythagorean theorem, and that's what you may recognize it as or, hear, or remember, um, which was attributed to the Greek mathematician Pythagoras. It has since been changed to the sum of squares or to that um, name or concept to recognize the fact that Pythagoras was not the first person to work with this concept. So he was the one who had it named after him. That doesn't necessarily mean that he was the first one to come up with it. So there is record of sum of squares on a 4,000-year-old tablet known as the Plimpton 322. Don't ask me why they came up with that name. Um, which indicates that ancient Babylonians and Egyptians were using this con math concept hundreds of years prior to Pythagoras. So basically the idea is, is just giving credit where credit is due. He wasn't the first one to come up with it. Um, he wasn't the only one working on it. Um, so that is why we call it now the sum of squares, basically, um, the term for what we're actually doing, um, in this concept or formula. Now the sum of squares is a relationship between the three sides of a right angle triangle. So you want to keep in mind, if we do not have a right angle triangle, this formula or concept does not work. So in order to use this, we must label the sides of a right angle triangle and the labels we're going to be using are legs and hypotenuse. So we should be able to indicate where the 90 degree angle is. It's indicated by a square instead of a, an arc to represent the angle. The two legs are the two sides that form that 90 degree angle. So if I look here, this leg forms that part of our angle and the other legs forms the other side. The remaining side is the hypotenuse or H. It's the longest side of the triangle. Right, we can see that when we go across, it's the longest side of our triangle here. Another useful thing, if we're not sure which side is the hypotenuse, right, it's always across from the 90 degree angle. 
So the hypotenuse is the longest side. It's always across from the 90 degree angle. And the nice thing about having the two legs, those are the two sides that are gonna make up that 90 degree angle here. And we're gonna to have to see that because otherwise if it's not indicated that it's a right angle triangle, we can't use Pythagorean theorem or sorry, the sum of squares. So again, the two sides that form the 90 degree are our legs. The third side, the longest side, the one that's across from 90 degrees, that's our hypotenuse. Now what the relation states is that the sum of the areas of the two squares on the legs equals the area of the square on the hypotenuse. So essentially what that's, that's saying is, if I look at this triangle here, if I look at a square made off of the length of this leg, three by three, I get an area of nine. If I look at a square made off of this leg, four by four, I get an area of 16. If I look at the area of the square off of the hypotenuse, in this case, five by five, I get 25. So what the relationship or the sum of squares says that nine plus 16 will equal the square on the hypotenuse, which is 25. And nine plus 16 does equal 25. So that is essentially what the concept is saying. If I square the two, the two legs and add them together, it's gonna equal the hypotenuse squared. We can summarize it as a formula as a squared plus b squared equals c squared, and a and b are the lengths of the legs, and c is the length of the hypotenuse. And so that's one of the key things to look at. And a and b are the lengths of the legs. It doesn't really matter which one is which. Um, they're, they're allowed to be interchangeable, um, just as long as we keep it consistent throughout the question. But c will always refer to as the hypotenuse, or the longest side. So if we're looking at a question, for example, if we want to find the length of the hypotenuse, we want to find this side. What we first need to do is we need to label our sides just to make sure we're clear on what our legs are and what our hypotenuse is. So in this case, we've labeled our legs. We can see these are the two sides that form the 90 degree angle and our hypotenuse is the side that is across from it. Again, for purposes of our formula, our hypotenuse is C. Our legs could be A or B, either one doesn't really matter. So based on the formula that I've already entered, I'm gonna label this leg A and this leg B. Realistically, you could have switched it around and you'd still get the same answer. Now what we need to do is substitute all those values into our formula. So A squared or 33 squared plus B squared or 55 squared equals C squared, which is unknown. We square our values. Remember, squaring means multiplying by itself. 33 times 33, 55 times 55, not 33 times 2 and 55 times 2. When we add them together, we end up at this step here, 4,105 equals C squared. You might think you're done. But if you compare that answer to, our pre to the sides that we know, 4,105 seems quite big quite large for a side when the other ones are 33 and 55, even if the hypotenuse is supposed to be larger. What we have to do is we don't want C squared. I don't want the area of that square off the hypotenuse. I want the length. So what we have to do after we add up the squared areas, we have to square root at the end. We have to square root that number. So the square root of 4,105 is 64.07. That is our final answer. That is the final measurement of the hypotenuse. And you can compare that now to your other sides. So 64.07 does make more sense. It, it is larger than the two legs and it is kind of in the same ballpark of size. It's not drastically larger like that 4,105 is. So that's how you can also kind of just look at the answer and kind of compare did I get it? Did I get it right? At least at, at, um, at a surface level of uh, checking.
The other scenario that we might come across is if we have to find the length of a missing side that's a leg. So in my, in my question here, I'm missing this leg. I have the hypotenuse, I have the side or one leg, but I'm missing the second one. So we still have to label, we still have to identify our legs and our hypotenuse. And then what we're going to do is we're now going to use a rearranged formula. So rather than have it equal c squared, it's going to be a squared equals c squared minus b squared. So this is slightly different. It's the same formula, we've just rearranged it. Now one thing to note, depending on how you label your legs, right? in this case I've labeled this b and this one a, Again, our hypotenuse is always C. But in our formula, right, for finding a missing leg, if I rearranged it and labeled this B and this A, I could just easily change those two values in that formula. It wouldn't make, a, it wouldn't affect anything that I have to do. So A and B, I've labeled them as such, and now I'm entering in my values, plugging them in, and solving. So 30 squared minus 23 squared, 900 minus 529, I get 371 is equal to a squared. Again, at this point, you could, you could say, well, I'm done, I have a squared. But if we look at that answer, we see it's not quite representative of the actual side. 371 is quite large. It's larger than the hypotenuse, which doesn't make sense for a leg, and it's larger than the other leg by a drastic amount. So again, remember, don't forget to square root at the end. So we square root that number, we get 19.26. That makes more sense. That kind of fits our idea. Now you might argue, well, looking at the triangle, that's, that's bigger. That side A is bigger than B. How is it 19.26? Well, that's an error on my part in terms of how I drew the triangle. But you will find that not every triangle drawn is to scale. Now it does make sense in that both sides or both legs are smaller than the hypotenuse. This formula fits, it's just not drawn correctly. Right? So you have to keep in mind that most of the triangles are not drawn to scale. So when you're looking at these, don't trust or don't look and say, oh, well, that, that missing leg is larger than the other one, so it has to be a bigger value. Trust in the math, right? Look more for is the measurement drastically bigger, meaning you forgot to square root. Right. So let's go through a couple of examples, one to just try on each one. So I'll try B for the first one. So if I'm saying if I want to find the area of the indicated square for each of the following diagrams, I have 100 centimeters squared for the hypotenuse, or C by C. I have 36 centimeters squared for one of the legs, say B by B, and I'm missing the other one, A by A. So in this case, if I'm trying to find the missing side, since it's C squared equals, or since it would be A squared, because it's the missing side, equals C squared minus B squared, I get a squared is equal to 100 because this is already the area. So I don't need to square anything. So 100 minus 36. And I get a squared is equal to 64. So that's all that this question is asking. What is the area of the square? So in this case, it is 64 centimeters squared. Now I could go through and continue and find the actual side length if I wanted to. Um, but all the question is asking for is just the area of that square. Two. Two is now asking to find the actual missing side. So I'll go through standard one, I'll go through A, and then I'll leave the rest for you to practice. So I have my hypotenuse already labeled. I'm going to label my legs A and B just to help. And I get A squared plus B squared equals C squared because I'm looking for the hypotenuse. So we have 6 squared plus 15 squared equals c squared, 36 plus 225 equals c squared, 
261 equals c squared. Doesn't make sense in terms of our actual um, sides. So I do have to square root this now. I can tell because I was finding c squared, not c. So when I square root, I get 16.16 centimeters, which equals C. So that does make sense. It is larger than um, it is larger than the other sides, which makes sense because it is the hypotenuse. So again, try to go through the rest of the practice questions on your own. Get comfortable with using the sum of squares formula to either find the hypotenuse or one of the legs. We'll move into the next lesson. So the next lesson is area and perimeter of composite shapes. So when looking at perimeter, we are looking at the distance around the outside of a shape. Right? Think of if we have a shape and we're putting up fencing. Right, the distance around the shape, that's the perimeter. Area is the amount of space inside a shape, right? So amount of area that it covers. One thing to note, perimeter is in linear units, so centimeters, inches, feet, meters. Area is in centimeters squared, inches squared, feet squared, meters squared. So our units are squared when we're dealing with area. Now you may find it helpful to use the predetermined formulas to calculate the perimeter and area of objects. There are formula sheets at the end of this package. Um, and it is helpful to know that when you're working with circles, the perimeter of a circle is referred to as the circumference. So when it asks for the circumference, it just means the perimeter of the circle. Now the formula sheets provide the formulas for simpler basic shapes, rectangle, parallelogram, triangle, trapezoid, circle, square, things like that. But what happens when we come across shapes that aren't basic? What happens when we come across shapes that are what we call composite shapes, a shape created with two or more basic shapes? What happens in that scenario? Well, if you're trying to find the area of composite shapes, break it up into simple shapes and then add or subtract the areas. When you're trying to find the perimeter of a composite shape, you're still trying to find the distance around the shape, so nothing really changes there. You might have to do a few minor calculations, but overall, when you're looking at the area of a composite shape, break it up into the simple shapes you know, and then add them or subtract them given what your composite shape looks like. So first one, right, we wanna find the area of the following composite shape. So this kind of um, Tetris looking shape, kind of like a backwards R or an upside down L. Right, so the first thing we wanna do is divide this shape up into the basic shapes. So we're dividing this up into two rectangles. So we can see I've drawn the dotted line across. Now, one thing to note, when you're working with composite shapes, you may not always divide it up the same way. Someone could divide it up differently, right? You could draw a line down here, right? or I'll do it on the bigger one. You could draw a line down here and separate it up into these two shapes instead. That would work as well. Now you're not going to say, well, I'm going to draw a line across here, form a triangle, form another triangle here, right? make it like that, right? That you could, a little bit more complicated, um, but in terms of trying, trying to keep it simple, there might be more than one way. So we divide it up into the basic shapes, and then we find the area of those basic shapes, right? So we have our first one, our area one, finding the area, length times width using our formulas. We have A2 second area for this little square or smaller rectangle. One thing to note, you might be using some of the measurements that are given to help us find the new measurements of these basic shapes. Right? Because it's um, we're breaking up a shape into smaller shapes, right? we might not have the individual measurements, so we might have to actually calculate those. Similar to what we did here to calculate the the length of that smaller shape. So we took the overall length here, the 18 centimeters. We took the 18 centimeters, we subtracted 11 from it, and the difference was seven, which was our missing side. Once we have our two areas, we add them together, 
and that gives us the area of the composite shape. So in total, this shape has an area of 166.5 centimeters squared. Looking at the next one, same idea, right? We have this kind of dome shaped object. We're gonna divide it up into a semicircle and a rectangle. We're then gonna go through and find the area for each, right? So area one, our rectangle, again, a straightforward area formula, length times width. And our semicircle, we have the formula for a circle, which is pi r squared or area for area two. It's asking for r. R is the radius, right? Radius is half the diameter. So the diameter is the entire distance across. The entire distance across is our diameter. If we want the radius, which most formulas do call for, we're gonna divide the diameter by two. 14 divided by two is seven. So that is where we get the seven measurement from. So we plug that into our circle formula we get 153.93. We then divide that by two because we have a semicircle or half a circle. So you're not gonna find formulas for semicircles or quarter circles or things like that. But what you can do is find the area of a circle and then divide it up um, based on what object we have. Once we find the area of our two shapes, we add them together and get our composite area. So 160.97. Just going to go, there are a couple examples here. Just going to go through one. I'll go through B, relatively straightforward. So I have this house looking object. I'm going to divide it up into two shapes. I'm going to call the square or the rectangle one A1. A2 is my triangle. I need to find the area for both. Rectangle is relatively straightforward. Length times width. This is just coming from the formula sheet at the end of our lesson or at the end of the package. So 21 times, oops, 21 times 16, I get 336 centimeters squared. Again, it's area, so it's squared. For my second area, the triangle, I see the base of the triangle. So base times height divided by two, I see the base is 21. The height I don't have. I don't have this height here, but I do know that the overall thing is 32. So if the entire height of this object is 32 centimeters, then this missing height is going to be 32 centimeters minus the 16 we already have, which equals 16. So 21 times 16 divided by 2. is us 168. And you might say, well, why are we dividing by two? You said just to kind of do it um, and then divide based on the shape, but we have a whole triangle. Well, the formula for a triangle is dividing by two, right? So that divide by two is part of the formula for, for finding the area of a triangle. So I found the area for my two shapes. To find the total area, I'm gonna add the two up, 336 plus 168. and we get 504 centimeters squared. So that is the area of this composite shape. So again, you can go through, try some of these practice questions um, involving composite shapes. Remember to break it up into the initial shapes and then add them together as needed. In the next lesson, we're going to be looking at volume and surface area. So this is going to be now looking at 3D objects, whereas perimeter and area, we're looking at 2D objects. So when we look at volume or when we talk about volume, we're talking about the amount of space that an object occupies, or basically the amount of space that is enclosed within a container. Right? So think you have like a cup or a box, how much you can fill in that cup or box is considered the volume. The surface area is the total area of the surface of a three-dimensional object, right? So for example, we have a box, right? We, we, the volume is how much we can fill in that box. The surface area is if we unfold that box and we lay it flat, 
how much space does that box take up? So, so that's the difference between the two. We kind of see the diagram over here. We have our, our volume in terms of filling it up and we have our surface area when we're looking at the net um, or the unfolded shape. Again, when we're talking about volume, it is measured in cubic units or basically the power of three. Surface area, because it's area, it's in squared units. Again, the formula sheets at the end of this package will have all the formulas that you will need in terms of finding the volume and surface area. One thing with um, sur or the volume, there are some relationship between 3D objects. So if we look at the formulas of these 3D objects, we can actually see some relationships. For example, a square base pyramid and a cube. If they have the same length and width, which would mean basically if, if our dimensions for the base of the pyramid is equal to the dimensions of a cube or of equal dimensions, right? So they just have the same ones. Then the, there will be three pyramids whose volume can fit inside one cube. And that's why the pyramid formula is basically the cube formula divided by three. The same would apply if we're looking at a rectangular prism. If the base has the same dimensions as a rectangular prism base does, then it, three of those pyramids would fit into the prism. When looking at a cone and a cylinder, similar idea. If we have similar heights, I guess I should go back and say the height of the pyramid would also equal the height of our box or our cube. So if the height of our cone is the same as the cylinder and the radius of the cone is the same as the radius of our cylinder, we'll be able to fit three cones inside one cylinder in terms of volume. And that's why the cone formula of, is the cylinder formula divided by three. So if they're equal measurements, um, same dimensions, then you would have three cones fitting into one cylinder in terms of volume. Now, when you're finding volume and surface area, again, nothing too tricky. You're just plugging values into a formula. There is a checklist that you can kind of go through to help make sure you're on the right task or the right track. Check to make sure you have the correct formula. Do you have the right shape? Ensure you have the correct values, right? So compare your 3D shape to the shape on the formula sheet, right? You might have to orientate it a little bit differently, but the formula sheet does label all the sides you need, so you just have to find the corresponding sides on the shape that you have. You may have to determine the radius from the diameter, so similar to the previous lesson. And then finally, check to make sure you have the correct units. Right? Again, remember if the units are cubed for volume and they're squared for surface area. So let's look at a couple examples. So we want to determine the volume and surface area for the following shape, a cylinder. So going to our formula sheet, we have the volume and surface area formulas. And usually you should always go to the very bottom of each kind of row for the actual formula. Um, in some cases, they might give you the general formula, what we're doing first, and then they kind of add in the actual values. For surface area, it talks about what surfaces we're looking at and then gives us the actual formulas at the very end. So for volume, V equals pi R squared H. You, we will need to calculate the radius first because it gives us the diameter. Right, again, remember the diameter is the distance across from one side to the other going through the center. The radius is just half of that. So we can take our diameter of 8 divided by 2 to get a radius of 4. So we plug our values in. We don't have to worry about anything with the height. Um, the one thing we forgot to mention a little bit, we didn't deal with circles in the last lesson. Um, pi means 3.14. Technically, pi is a is a never-ending decimal, um, or it hasn't ended yet. Um, so there's a lot more decimal places after. But in terms of approximation, we can just use 3.14. Now, most calculators will have a pi button that ha that contain a lot more decimal places. Whichever one you choose to use is up to you. Right? You might get a slightly different answer. Um, but it shouldn't be a drastically different answer. 
So in our volume formula, we plug our, our radius and our height in, and we get a volume of 603.19 centimeters cubed. Our surface area, we plug in our radius and our height into the two different parts, and we go through and we calculate, and we end up with a surface area of 402.12 centimeters squared. Looking at the next example, so a triangular prism, again, we're taking the formula from the formula sheet at the end of the package. We have our volume and surface area formulas. We've gone through and we've kind of orientated our triangle um, to help us figure out what dimensions are which, right? So the eight is representing the L, the 12 is the B, the 10 is the A, and so is the other 10, that is our C, and then our H is our 19. Right? So you can see the orientations, the rotations between the formula sheet diagram and the diagram in our question. It's a little bit different. So you do have to kind of match up those shapes. Volume, base times length times height divided by 2. 12 times 8 times 19 divided by 2. And we get 912 inches cubed. Surface area, B times L plus A times H plus B times H plus C times H. Right, so this is where it's very important that you do have the correct um, dimensions in for the correct variable or correct letter. And we go through and we calculate. In the end, we get 704 inches squared. Right, so again, squared for area, cubed for volume. Nothing too complicated. We're just plugging in um, the formulas or plugging in the variables into our formulas. So in the next one, Finding the volume and surface area of the following shapes. I'll go through the first one with you. Um, it is a relatively easy one. The volume for a for a rectangular prism is length times width times height. So in this case, I'll say L, H, and W. In this case, so three times eight times ten, two hundred and forty millimeters cubed. Looking at the next one, or not looking at the next one, but looking at the volume or the surface area of our of our prism. The surface area formula in this case is two times the width times height plus length times width plus length times height. We have two times eight times 10 plus three times eight plus three times 10, basically representing the pairs of different faces. So we get two times 80 plus 24 plus 30. So two times 134, which gives us 268 millimeters squared. Now you might say, well, how is the vo how is the area different than the volume, right? Volume should probably be larger, right? You're filling it, not laying it flat. And that's true, uh, but keep in mind the cubed part of the units do does imply that me millimeters cubed is a, obviously a different measurement um, than millimeters squared. Um, so you can't really compare the two that way. So don't worry if your surface area is more than your volume or your volume is more than your surface area, right? Just go back and trust and or verify that you've plugged everything in correctly and done the math correctly. I won't go through B, but one thing you might have to do, depending on the formula, you might need to use the sum of squares to find missing sides. So in our cone example, we need to find side S it doesn't give it to us, but hopefully we see a right angle triangle form between the height and the radius of our cone. So we could use the sum of squares or the a squared plus b squared equals c squared first to find that value. So in this case, for example, 19 squared plus 16 squared equals s squared or c squared. We get 617 equals s squared. We need to square root again. 
find our s. If you're unsure of what we're doing here, make sure you go back and review that sum of squares lesson. Square root, and we get 24.8. So again, that makes sense that this measurement is 24.8. It is larger than our two legs, and it is the hypotenuse, so it should be larger. Now we should have enough information to go through and find the volume and surface area for the cone. So that is something you might have to do in some cases, depending on the shape. So again, make sure you're going through completing the practice questions for you to work through that. I'll give you a hint. For F, you are going to need, or actually, no, F, you don't have to worry about that. We've already given you um, all the measurements you'll need. Just keeping in mind that this 13.85, that's the height of the pyramid. The 16 feet is the height of the face. Our next lesson is angle geometry. So this might be a, lot, a review of a lot of what you covered maybe in grade eight. Um, nothing too new in this, um, in this unit. We have a couple rules. We have five rules to look at first and then a couple of properties. So rule one, a straight line. So the sum of angles that form a straight line is 180 degrees. So these two angles, right, we talk about them forming a straight line because if I go from here to here, that angle would form a straight line. So 110 plus 70 is 180. Around a point, so if I go kind of all the way around, all those angles have to add up to 360 or a full turn. Opposite angles, so if I have two lines that cross, the opposite angles are equal. So A and A, B and B, right? We see by the color as well. So opposite angles are equal. Sometimes you might see this as the X pattern, right? Because the two lines crossing form an X. Rule four, these are parallel angle rules. So when we're dealing with parallel angles, right? There's three patterns we might come across. The Z pattern, so when we draw a Z, I'll highlight it actually, when we draw a Z, the two angles that form from that are equal. Now one thing to note, it doesn't need to be your traditional Z, right? It could be backwards like that. It could be upside down, right? It doesn't always need to be in this, this rotation. Corresponding angles or F pattern, right? So when we have or when the lines form to make an F, these two angles here are equal. Now again, similarly, it doesn't need to be always this um, a traditional F shape, right? It could be backwards. So then these two angles are equal. It could be upside down. So these two angles are equal. And it could be upside down and backwards so that these two angles are equal. Lots of different orientations for the F pattern, um, but again, as long as you have the right angles picked, then we know which ones are going to be equal. Finally, for the C pattern, the co-interior angles, the C pattern states that the two angles between two parallel lines add to 180. So we can see the C pattern here. They form, those two angles form 180 degrees. Again, it doesn't need to be your traditional C pattern. It could be reversed. It could be a backward C as well. And these two angles would add to 180. So again, the key thing for this is that different orientations are allowed. It doesn't need to be the same um, orientation um, as we traditionally see the F, Z, and C. The final rule is looking at triangles. So we might have equilateral triangles where all the angles are equal, so all the sides are equal, all the angles are equal. Isosceles triangle, the two base angles are equal. Right, so when we talk and we see this little diagram down here, when we talk about isosceles, the base angles are the ones on the bottom, right, of kind of the, of the two sides that are equal. And then scalene triangles, all different sides, all angles are different. The other thing, all angles in a triangle add to 180 degrees. So those are five rules. There are some triangle rules, right? some kind of ones that might not use them too often, but they are some properties that we do see. 
So a, a line segment joining the midpoints of two sides of a triangle is parallel to the third side and also half as long. So we see that D and E are midpoints of our two sides. And we can see that the line formed here is parallel to our bottom side, if I could draw a straight line. And BC is double the size of DE. Right, so if this was 10, this would be 5. The next property is that the height of the triangle formed by joining the two midpoints of the side of the triangle is half the height of the original triangle. So if I see my midpoints, DE, the height of this new little triangle here, this height, AF, is double the height of the original triangle. So again, if this height was 10, the smaller triangle would be five. And lastly, the medians, the line going from the vertex to the midpoint, so we can see from Z to the midpoint, halfway of a triangle bisects it, its area. So basically the area of this triangle is equal the area of this triangle. Right, so it's just some different properties that you might come across um, or unique things that happens when we're dealing with or dividing up triangles. Some angle relationships in triangles. Right, so property one, the sum of the exterior angles is 360 degrees. So all the outside angles of a triangle is 360 degrees. It doesn't matter what the inside ones are, the exterior angles add to 360 degrees. An exterior angle, so in this case angle Z, is equal to the sum of the two opposite interior angles. Right? So X and Y in this case. So X plus Y will equal angle Z or the exterior angle. exterior angle is equal to the sum of the opposite interior angles. When we're looking at quadrilaterals, four-sided figures, there's also some properties we want to take into consideration. One, the sum of interior angles, so all the angles on the inside is 360 degrees. Right, so W plus Z plus Y plus X all add to 360. Similar to how the interior angles of a triangle are 180 degrees. The sum of exterior angles on a parallel or on a quadrilateral is also 360 degrees, right? So that is the same as the triangle. And you'd find if you looked at all other sided figures, you would find that the exterior angles always add up to 360, regardless of what or how many sides there are. So that's kind of a unique property amongst all shapes. So for this section or this note, um, there are some practice questions. I'm not going to go through these because these are um, a little bit more multiple choice, a little bit easier. Um, it's not so much step by step. Um, and some of them, for example, um, when we get to some of the kind of these different ones, a little bit larger ones, especially down and we see four with parallel lines, there are different ways that you can solve it, right? There's still going to be one right answer, but there's different strategies that you can use, different ways you can get to those answers, right? So make sure you're using those properties to kind of go back and um, find or answer the following questions about finding missing angles. Our final lesson is going to look at circle geometry. So this is just looking at angles um, involving circles or lines within a circle. Now there are some GeoGebra links, so you can type in the links. It basically takes you to an interactive of these different properties. Um, but we will go through what those properties are. So in our... Um, in our diagram, we have a central angle, so an angle that's formed around the center of our, um, of our circle. And we have an inscribed angle. An inscribed angle is formed in the interior of a circle with two chords that intersect on the circle. Right? So basically two lines that intersect, or basically a chord is going from one side of a circle we're basically connecting two part points on a circle. 
So we can see that we have a point here and here. Can't really tell the difference of what I just colored in. So we have a point here and here. So that line formed between those two points is a chord, same as their D and C. Those two points form a line, they intersect on a circle. So what the property is saying is that the central angle is two times or double the size of the inscribed angle, which we can see when we compare these two angles. Our next property is when we have an angle subtended or connected by the diameter. So angle ABC, this inscribed angle, right, it's formed by two chords, right, two points where the chord is aligned, two points that form <clears throat> um, or intersect on a circle. So that line, those are two chords. And it's subtended or connected, those two chords, so this chord here and this chord here are connected by a diameter. So the diameter goes through the center of a circle. It's still a chord because it has two intersection points on the circle, but it goes through the center. So when we have an inscribed angle that is subtended or connected by the diameter, the inscribed angle is 90 degrees. Again, you can go to that um, diagram or that interactive um, to check or verify that property. Perpendic perpendicular bisector to a chord. So if two lines are perpendicular, they intersect at 90 degrees. Right? We talked, we know that from our previous lessons in the, in the linear relations unit. If BC so if BC is a chord, then point D, or the line that's drawn perpendicular to that, through the center, is going to intersect, or basically divide, our line or our chord into two. So if BC is a chord, D is the midpoint, the line that's drawn through it, will be a perpendicular bisector between the center and that line. The final one, inscribed angles in subtended by the same arc. So this is similar to the one where it's subten subtended by the diameter. We have an inscribed angle. We can see the chords are forming. So we have D and C, D and B, we have E, and C, E, and B, so two different angles. We can see that the points that, we're, that they're connecting on the outside of the circle, C, B for both of them, they are form or connected by the same arc. Right? So they're connected by the same arc on the triangle. When that's the case, we see that the two angles, or those two inscribed angles, are equal. Right, so you can kind of call this column like a W pattern because it kind of forms like a W. Um, and the other one, the main other one that we're looking at with the ang other angles, other inscribed angles where it's double, this is almost like a Star Trek, right? It's kind of like it looks like a symbol, like the Star Trek logo or insignia, right? So you can kind of think of those two kind of patterns or shapes when you're looking for or trying to remember these properties. So I'll go through two examples just so we can kind of get comfortable with this because these ones are probably a little bit different from the other angle ones. But here in A, we have an inscribed angle and a central angle. Right? So that means that angle C, A, well, it doesn't really say what the other one is, so we won't worry about too much about that. We'll say angle A. Angle A is going to be two times the size of angle D based off our property. We know that angle D is 48. If we multiply that by 2, we get 96. That means that angle A is 96 degrees. B is just kind of working in reverse. I'm going to go through. I'm going to try to find like one over here. So F, this is one of the ones where subten or inscribed angles are subtended by the same arc. Right? We can see that these two angles are connected 
made by the same arc based on the two endpoints. If I draw lines kind of showing the two lines that form the angle, we can see that they all have the same kind of intersection points on the line and they're inscribed by the same angle. That means that this angle, let's say X and Y, not X and Y because we have X in there, let's say A and B, so angle A is going to equal angle B. So that means that 40 degrees is going to equal angle B. So that's our missing angle. So those are the two main properties that you're going to be looking at in this um, in this warm up or in this practice. And these are kind of just the two new properties that you might be coming across. The final part of this package is your formula sheets. So this is what we're referring to for the area and perimeter and volume and surface area lessons. Right, so again, please make sure you are familiar with it. Like I said before, you want to kind of go to the bottom of each one because it kind of breaks down how the different measurements are found or the different formulas are found and showing you a step by step. Not that, they're, not that any of them are wrong, but it, you might get confused about which one is which. More so for the volume and surface area. Again, the same note, you can use the pi button or 3.14. So for example, here, when we look at the surface area, it's telling us the two different dimensions that we're looking at for a cylinder. We're gonna be looking at a base and we're gonna be looking at a lateral surface. Those are the two faces or two types of faces that we have in our cylinder, right? Our bases are the top and the bottom. And then the lateral surface is basically the side, the parts that are going around. So we have to find the areas of those two parts, add them up. So when you're looking at the surface area formula, the main one you wanna focus on is that one. For the volume formula, it's breaking down where we get the volume formula from. We take the area of the base and we multiply it by the height. So again, not that that's wrong, but that doesn't really help you too much if you're trying to find or to solve for the volume. So you're gonna use that formula. And again, similar to all the other ones, right? That's the main one you're gonna use for the cone, for the surface area, that's the main one for, for a pyramid rectangular prism you're fine for a triangular base prism that's the formula you're going to use in some cases for if you're dividing or you have a fraction they may say well you can either multiply by the fraction or divide by the number either one is fine um, just different ways of thinking about the problem so I've gone through and kind of highlighted the key the actual formulas that you're going to need to use just in case you're a little bit unsure about what's the actual one. Just I will highlight the ones where there's only one, just so we don't have any confusion. Um, you can't say I didn't highlight it. But that's the end of this kind of um, independent study unit um, on measurement and geometry. So make sure you are going through, you're, you're going over the notes. Um, they're all filled out. You don't need to fill in anything for the notes, but highlight anything. Um, you can follow along with these videos or this video and highlight what I've highlighted, as well as make sure that you go through and do the practice questions because you will be given a completion mark based on um, the practice. Um, I've done, done a couple examples for you for each one for the most part to kind of give you um, a step by step um, instructions along with the note to hopefully ensure that you are comfortable going through and solving these questions.